Good morning and welcome everybody. Um, my name is Matthew Sampson. I'm going to be uh, speaking today about um, what are we talking about? Citizenship. Developing citizenship in the early childhood classroom. Um, and I just wanted to tell you a little bit about myself before we get started. So um, I have worked in the field of early child care for uh, 20 years. Um, most of that spent at Peter Green Hall Children's Center working as an after-schooler teacher or a school-age uh, teacher, but while working as a school-age teacher, working with infants, toddlers, junior preschoolers, senior preschoolers, along the way um, during the day when the children were at school. So I've got, uh, you know, a wide range of uh, examples and experiences from there. Um, also, I recently finished my uh, Master's of Child and Youth Study um, from Mount St. Vincent University and uh, did a thesis on uh, shifting practice. Um, and, uh, and I've published a couple of articles. I've been involved in uh, the Zombie World Project, which is a project that I did that I co-authored with Caroline Lean in her book, The Power of Emerging Curriculum. Um, and then I wrote an article with my partner here, Justin, called The Red Dress, which was in the outdoor play magazine that just launched last year. And I had an article in the Journal of Early Childhood Study last year um, about shifting from a rules-based curriculum to a negotiated curriculum. And uh, I also, we also did a YouTube series last year uh, at the tail end of last year uh, with uh, six videos on just some little ideas, some basic ideas about uh, early childhood and the classroom. Uh, and uh, finally, I was also the Prime Minister Award winner of Canada in 2018 and I got to meet Justin Trudeau. So um, I've had some pretty great experiences and made some pretty great connections across Canada uh, from that process. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, one of the things I also wanted to mention is um, the philosophy statement that I follow when making my decisions in the classroom, but also when talking with other people is, um, my job is to help children or people get what they want out of their life. So when I go into the classroom and I'm, you know, doing a rule or talking with them or challenging them, the intent behind it is helping them develop a skill that will help them get what they want out of life. Um, so I'm very rarely going to be developing the skill of take off your hat at the table because that doesn't help them get what they want out of life, things like that. So, um, yeah, so everything that I do comes from that philosophy statement. How about you, Justin? How does one follow up from that? That's pretty impressive. Uh, so my name's Justin. I have been in the field for 20 years. I, um, in that 20 years, I've worked in the classroom predominantly with toddlers and school, uh, preschool. And I have, um, what else? I have been an assistant director. I have been an inclusion coordinator, so my consulting. experience and consulting, so my experience ranges from different levels of the early child field. And currently I am working as the lead instructor of an Afrocentric early childhood program here in Nova Scotia, the first of its kind. And I have also won the Prime Minister Award of Excellence. Before you move on, he's an instructor of educators at the NSCC college. So he's teaching teachers, not small children at this point. Continue. Yes. And uh, what else have I? Done? When you won the Prime Minister's Award, uh, who did you get to meet? Stephen Harper. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Don't hold that against me. That's it right. was still pretty amazing. I've also written articles, um, like Matthew said, with him. And I also have three articles in this book with Carolyn Lee. Shocking. And uh, my education is my early childhood diploma. I have a NASCAD degree in fine arts and I have my master's degree from Boston University in art education, where my thesis project was following a four-year-old with the emerging curriculum lens. And in terms of my philosophy as an educator, it's rooted in community-based and uh, that helps develop citizens. Um, another thing that you might want to know about us is that we're actually a couple um, and we worked together for a while at Peter Green Hall and uh, since then 
we've stayed together, uh, and uh, continued in our career and had success together uh, and developed our theories together and challenged each other. Um, but that's why I know all about his experiences and he knows all about my experiences and we're a little bit silly with each other because we can be. Uh, so I really hope that you guys enjoy this uh, workshop and uh, we're excited to hear your questions afterwards. See you in a sec. Hello everybody and welcome to our workshop on developing citizenship in early childhood settings. Um, so the first thing we wanted to discuss is what is citizenship? I mean, what do we, how do we define citizenship, I guess is what I mean. So um, one of the most important parts for me of uh, citizenship is the difference between uh, doing with and doing to or for. So when um, I talk about citizenship, I talk about designing the classroom and designing the ideas and developing the curriculum with children um, rather than, you know, the old school version, which is we design the curriculum before the children arrive and then they accept that curriculum or don't accept that curriculum. And, you know, th that's where we are sort of thing. We design the classroom before they enter the classroom and then they come in and that's the classroom that we're in, regardless of their activities, of their ideas or of their, you know, their backgrounds even. So when I say citizenship, I mean kind of participation, the right to participation um, in things like decision making. Yeah. What do you think, Justin? Uh, well, I just want to go off of what you were saying in two examples. Oh, great. The first one would be developing the citizenship of um, them with a sense of place and belonging. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, where I have an arts background, um, things that I have done was take children to galleries and visit local artists and having that conversation between the two um, groups. And so that that leads into talking to community members where they say hello to people on the street or they help clean up um, parks and things like that. Mm -hmm. And the other part is uh, trying to develop a sense of um, culture or belonging in within the space. So how do the children represent themselves in the classroom? And how do we provide space for them to represent themselves? Yeah. And kind of like, not only space, but also that the knowledge that it is their space, not just they have to wait for us to create space. Like we don't have to put the bulletin board up to be like, yes, your pictures can go here, all lined up yeah. straight. Um, you know, when you've set up that culture um, and the children have citizenship, they, they don't necessarily wait for your approval on posting things up on the wall. Um, but starting from the very beginning to talk to them about like um, how things go into the space or how they can change things around. Mm. Because that's a part that a lot of people just will say, oh, well, Matthew, what do you think of me putting it there? But there's more to it. Yeah. And not just how, but why, you yeah. know, like why is something here and why is something else not here? Why do I have a kitchen with a stove here and I do not have a fireplace? Right. You know, why do I have a block area, but I don't have a metal working area? You know, those are decisions that we all make based on our experience and our, um, based on our experience and our, uh, available materials. So it's like, Sometimes we just go with what we know because that's what's expected, but it's not necessarily reflective of what the children want, what is in their lives, what is going to be helpful to their future. So we need to look beyond, you know, the very first thought that we have and try to get to the second thought, the third thought, or the negotiated thought, really. And it, and it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen overnight. You do have to put work into it and uh, constantly have that feedback, that reciprocal conversation. Conversation. Anyway, um, we're gonna move on to our next topic. All right, next we wanted to talk about the relationship. So, so um, the old school relationship between a teacher and child is kind of like 
Uh, I am the teacher, I'm the expert, I sit up higher, you call me Mr., Mrs., or whatever my pronoun may be, and uh, I call you by your first name, you sit down on the floor, I tell you what the rules are, I tell you what we're going to do, I evaluate what you've done and tell you how good you were. Um, and that is not the relationship that we want in when creating um, kind of authentic citizenship. Um, it, it, it's not kind of one directional. Um, so we talk about like um, reciprocal, respectful relationships. Um, and, you know, that's really just about I understand that your ideas come from your previous knowledge. I understand that you as the child um, have agency, you have desires, you have things that you want, you have things that you don't like, and you have the right to those ideas, likes and dislikes. Um, and you have the uh, right to kind of address them in, the, in that culture. Um, but similarly, I also have the right to that just because I'm the teacher doesn't mean I have to like everything. I don't have to, for instance, like your drawing, you know, oh, Matthew, do you, do you like my picture? No, I don't like your picture, but do you like your picture? You know, that sort of thing. So it's not like the value of your, your work or your, your drawing as the child is dependent on me liking it or not liking it. Um, that might sound a little harsh to some people, but um, when, when you, when you put yourself in that uh, role where you're no longer the like pacifier or appeaser of, you know, the, do you like me? This gives me value and makes me feel special. Then you can get beyond the, them trying to impress you uh, and, and actually getting to their ideas and their thoughts and their feelings and letting them challenge you. I mean, maybe you get it wrong and yeah. you're not ever going to get to that point where they're going to correct you or challenge you if, you know, all you're doing is saying, yes, I like your picture, or I will draw a picture for you, even. And I think, it, since you're talking about art, um, I used to uh, do art in the classroom. Mm. And what I mean by that is I would actually do my assignments for my university, and I would do it in class while I'm still working with the children. For his undergraduate degree. Yeah. And I was at Mascot University, and the children would critique my work. And that's only because... Um, we developed a relationship where they could be brutally honest with me and I could be honest with them. Like Matthew was saying, oh, I don't like your work and these are why. We backed it up with the reasons why we um, didn't like something so we could have that negotiated conversation about um, our aesthetics. Yeah, and it's not it's not like I walk up to children and see their picture. I'm like, ew, why are you drawing that? Like it, it's, it, it just comes from a place of if if you're looking for my opinion on this, scribble line that you made. I'm like, I don't really like that. You yeah. know, what I, I don't know what you were thinking about or what was your idea or what was happening. Sometimes they explain what was happening and then I, I love it. Um, I remember um, a coworker of ours once, Janice from Peter Green Hall, used to talk about how there's, there's this sweet spot when you're working with three-year-olds doing art and how sometimes you just have to, you know, quickly use a little bit of sleight of hand to take the picture away and give them a new one before they get into the really storytelling part of making the picture because right. they start with some uh, symbolized shapes that have meaning to them that they can express but then they get into the movement of those things and the movement becomes the scribble all over it and by the time that they are finished with it uh, they can no longer you can no longer recognize any thought in it sort of thing so I just kind of find that funny how she would you know, sneak that out as kind of like this, a step in the process for the parents to recognize that when you see the scribble, it's not just the scribble. You know, there's something under that scribble that, you know, now I have, I, I am able to show you what your child is doing mm -hmm. before the scribble gets there, that sort of thing. Um, anyway, and uh, since uh, I brought up parents, yes. um, another thing is developing a relationship with the parents. Um, you know, there, there are kind of two, I think, really simple, easy, not necessarily best relationships that we have with parents, um, which are the parents are the clients and we do what the parents want. If the parent wants the child to eat their banana first and their sandwich second and their chocolate bar third, then we're going to make sure that it goes in that order. Um, and then there's the other also not so helpful uh, I'm the teacher, I am the expert, I know what's going on, I'm going to make the rules, and you're just going to have to deal with it. When you leave your child in our care, 
we're doing it our way sort of thing. So yeah. those are, sorry. I need a balance. Yeah, you need, you need something in the middle, something negotiated, something where both parties feel that their opinion is taken into account and you actually come to like a negotiated resolution rather than, well, what I say goes sort of thing. And I have an example. Great. Let's so it. when I first started at Peter Green Hall, um, the children were talking about God and being superheroes, mm -hmm. but I wasn't listening to the superhero part. I just heard the God and the religion part. And so um, when this was going on, I just had the conversation with the children and we would talk about it. And, and then they started, the parents started seeing my documentation. And then um, a couple of parents were uncomfortable with that because they said, if the children are going to learn about religion, I, I want to be, as the parent, I want to be the one that's doing that. So I wanted them to actually sit down with me and read the documentation that I had where I wasn't imposing any of my religious beliefs or anything like that. It was actually coming from the child. And through that conversation, it finally got to the point where parents were now um, wanting to know more what the children were saying. So they decided that we would go to a synagogue because they'd never been to one. And they saw how them being a part of the curriculum through the children's eyes, uh, they got more information from that. Yeah, there was almost like this this freedom to not um, fight against a religion, uh, particularly for, uh, you know, historically opposed religions. We had um, some people from the Muslim religion come in and show interest in uh, the Jewish religion. So it was kind of like, wow, that's, that's really interesting. And it wasn't uh, people trying to convert or anything like that. I think the uh, the idea that it was coming from um, this citizenship, this participation, participatory negotiation of what religion was, they didn't have to defend their religion. It wasn't about their religion. It was about yeah. what is religion and through the eyes of the children, what, what are they seeing and, and what's important to them? So yeah, I, uh, I remember that example and I thought it was just uh, so, you know, oh, the world can be at peace finally sort of moment. And the children really were able to talk about um, really difficult topics. And sometimes they would get heated arguments, but I recorded exactly word for word what they were saying. Then I was able to talk to the parents about it and they got to see that it, they worked it out. They worked out some things that, you know, could actually help adults. Yeah. So, you know, in working, in uh, developing that relationship with parents, it's really about kind of using the children's work as evidence to support, you know, what's, what's going on in the classroom and decisions that are being made and, you know, and also asking for ideas and help from the parents. So um, I find when you have that, reciprocal relationship with parents where they feel like they have something to contribute but they don't necessarily feel like they're in charge of everything um there's a lot more giving you know a lot more offered and it, the great thing is it's not based on education level or socioeconomic status it's literally you know i i really appreciate what you're doing with the children yeah. and i have this idea something i saw on social media yeah. something i grew up with an old recipe or whatever it is and you know they feel like they are part of the classroom they're a citizen of the classroom kind of a, a citizen you know on the periphery because they don't spend as much time in the classroom but how about your example where there was a jewish family who saw that you were decorating um christmas and then they were like challenging you like well why aren't we celebrating hanukkah and then you said uh, this is a funny story. That's a great setup. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was, th there was this family who um, I hadn't yet built the trust with. They were very new to the classroom um, and they had very progressive but uh, rigid ideas. Um, so they, you know, they wanted everything to be open to everyone. Uh, they wanted to make sure that uh, pronouns were not assumed for children. Um, and, and things like along those lines. Um, and then we, the kids started talking about Christmas and Christmas trees and setting up things. And we're like, sure, you know, what do you want to set up? Um, you know, it all comes from the children and what's important to them. Um, and then the parent came in, the dad, and he's like, well, I see that you're doing Christmas. Are you going to be doing Hanukkah next? I'm like, sure, I don't know anything about Hanukkah. Um, what could we do? 
you know, and it was just that, um, I don't know, it, it was just that phrasing, I think, that really started to uh, open that relationship, ooh, open that relationship with that family. And, uh, you know, he showed up, he brought in a book about latkes, and um, he brought the stuff in to make latkes afterwards, um, which are a Jewish potato pancake that they serve at uh, Hanukkah. Anyway, I, I don't know much about the religion, but it was just wonderful for uh, him to feel empowered to come in in response to uh, Christmas being brought up by the children. Um, and, and, and just wonderful for everybody to have that enriching moment that something else, you know, is, uh, I don't know, something new, something that none of us had the experience with. They were the, um, they were the first family that brought uh, Jewish religious um, holidays or knowledge at all into the classroom. Um, so it was, it was really uh, wonderful for me to learn, learn something new that was always there. It was always in the periphery. I'm aware of these events happening, but um, it was the first time that somebody had shared it. And it was, you know, 15 years into my career. It wasn't early on. So um, it was really great to, you know, be refreshed by something that, I don't know, I should have known about before then. And, you know, that was just the day. So yeah. really good when you can uh, take... Um, a relationship. That's the other thing I wanted to talk about actually. Um, the relationship with parents, I find it is, is kind of this really funny, you wouldn't expect it thing. The parents that you have the most struggle with in the beginning are the parents who love you forever. Um, there was a parent in my class, in my school age classroom, who used to complain to me about how I wore shorts year round. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a warm guy and I like to wear shorts even in the snow. Uh, I'll wear boots and a coat too, but I just don't like my legs to be covered up um, because it makes me uncomfortable. Um, and she had a problem with it because her son saw me as a mentor and thought he didn't have to wear uh, pants and he could wear shorts year round. Um, and they were from Libya, so it was so cold here for mom, but their son had grown up in Canada, so it wasn't as cold for him. Anyway, she would, you know, she would complain to me and fight with me about what I should be wearing <laughs> to work. Uh, with the children and I'm like, I'm going to wear what I'm comfortable wearing because I'm an adult and I can make that decision for myself. Um, but you're the adult in your child's life that gets to make those decisions. So you don't really have to, you know, you, you just make that choice, um, you know, which is hard for parents. And I understand that, but it, it's one of those things that it's like, well, that's one of the choices that you can make. You could drop it off here. I'll put, I'll put the stuff on them. I don't mind, but um, I'm not going to change me because you want your son to do the things that I'm doing that you want me to do for them to follow. Anyway, uh, you know, fast forward 10 years later, I hadn't seen her in about eight years and she saw me on the side of the road and pulled over and got out to give me a hug. And it was just such a, you know, such a change. I mean, we had a relationship, you know, for the two years that was very strong after that kind of battle between us. But, um, you know, eight years later, there's um, a woman who wears a hijab who, you know, typically doesn't really interact with, typically doesn't really interact with uh, random men. Um, and, you know, she got out of her car to give me a hug on the side of the road. And it's just so wonderful that, you know, she, she felt I was like family still after eight years. Um, and, you know, even to this day, I, uh, her, she has a, a much younger son and he's at our school now. And she came to me to solve a problem that was going on in the school because she knew she could trust me. And we had built that relationship of, uh, of trust and negotiation way back when, you know, through some difficult times. So, you know, it's, uh, it's important to, you know, it may be a little uncomfortable, but it's important to go through that discomfort to get to the really good, uh, strong relationships of trust with parents. All right, we're going to talk about another topic. Go. All right, well, next we wanted to talk about documentation and the impact that documentation has on um, developing that sense of citizenship within the classroom. So when I say documentation, what I'm talking about is pedagogical documentation. So like um, meaningful uh, documentation uh, about the children's thinking, learning, playing, um, about their ideas, about their 
frustrations and things like that. And, you know, we document in various ways, uh, written conversations, uh, photographs, sometimes video, if that's, if that's your thing. And what we try to capture is, um, we try to understand what is meant through their expressions. So, for example, um, one of the things that we've been talking about is artwork. So when the children are drawing a picture, um, we want to we want to use that picture to kind of like get at what they're thinking about. Um, my children right now are talking about Halloween, which is kind of funny. Um, and they were um, using their, you know, they're using their uh, drawing skills and making the really sharp lines to sh show how scary uh, the face is of their monsters or pumpkins or whatever it is they're drawing. Um, and, you know, they just make that mark and then they leave it. So, you know, we, we take that and we go back with them and ask them, and we're like, you know, what uh, what were you thinking about when you were making this picture? What is, you know, what's happening here? And they um, can be more expressive about, you know, how scary it is. And, you know, they use their whole body kind of in that expression. So we want the documentation there as kind of a reference point for their um, for their meaning, the, the meaning that they were trying to put out into the world at the time. And, uh, oh, you had something. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to kind of go up and when you do make the meaning, it's, you're taking exactly a snippet or a, the capturing that moment that, that existed at that time. And you're trying to like represent it the best way that you can. So you don't have to go into like all of this, like extra, extra stuff. It's literally keeping it. Yeah, it's like um, the parents aren't there to see uh, these moments of their children and you're trying to capture it in an authentic way that represents um, what was happening, you know, while they were at work or while they were studying or whatever it is that they're doing and uh, allow them this, uh, you know, this part of their child's childhood and this insight into the what their children are thinking about and wondering about and trying. So, I mean, earlier we talked about the... Um, religion project. Mm -hmm. So that was a perfect example that I literally um, copied word for word and who said what in the conversation. And so it was a lot of um, notes, but the parents actually sat down and read um, line by line exactly what the children had said um, in that time that I had with them. So they could see that how the children were thinking mm -hmm. and then how did they come up with a resolution based on the back and forth. Yeah, it is really great for the parents, but also for the children in the classroom. When we put up our documentation, the children can see themselves reflected in it. They can see that their ideas are worth taking our time, aside from the time we're spending with each other, um, to, you know, to put this important piece of paper up about what they were doing. Um, so, you know, it's it's really great for them to see. And, and that's what kind of the beginning stages of uh, their kind of self-importance, their self-value within the classroom is um, putting their words up and and going back to them with the children. So, and, and one of the easiest ways to do that is to include a picture. Yeah. You know, the children can, you know, at any age higher than, uh, I don't know, pretty much any age, children can kind of recognize themselves in pictures. Yeah. Um, maybe not uh, younger infants, but... After that, you know, when children are expressing things verbally, they can they can see themselves, and the the picture gets them there, and they start talking, and um, and then they get into the words, and wow, you you wrote down that I said that, yeah, that was really important to you. Oh, well, my idea was important. Um, so it, it's kind of the beginning stages of uh, of just getting their importance, uh, making them aware of their importance in the classroom. So and also, I just want to point out that some things that I have done over the years is sometimes I would purposely misquote them so that when I read it back to them, they could say to me, I didn't say that, but that's because we built a culture to let them s have that space to come back to me and say, no, Justin, I didn't say this. I wanted you to say this. Right. So, yeah. So, um, when I was doing the zombie world project project in the, uh, after schooler classroom at Peter Green Hall, um, I remember I wrote something down the wrong way, not on purpose, purely accidentally. And the children were old enough to remember the, 
you know, the week and a half before that, that conversation happened, they're like, that is not what I said. Yeah. That is not how that happened, Matthew. You need to fix that. And I just found that so, you know, validating that they, you know, felt the right to correct my work that was already on the wall, you know, and it wasn't even like, what do you guys think about this? It was literally just posted on the wall and they're like, oh, you got it all wrong, buddy. Like, get over here and fix this sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it's really wonderful when um, they have the ability to uh, reflect on their own ideas and uh, and even correct them. And yep. to just like slow it down a little bit, um, especially when you're working in toddlers, mm -hmm. if you can like uh, sit down with them and even have your notepad and, and just start writing one or two things, get them used to the idea of you validating their their words. work or their words and you're actually seeing it happen and then you're able to put it up somewhere or tell it back to them. Um, it, it should start, and you know, you could even start that in, in any age group, but like, that's just important that they're seeing that you are using these tools to do that. Not only that, but also uh, photography, uh, taking pictures of children. Um, I find that when children spend a lot of their time with their family uh, taking pictures, their first response to a camera is to stop what they're doing and pose and smile. Like, I'm ready for the picture now. Yeah. Um, and that is not what we want in the documentation. We want to capture the moment of frustration, the moment of concentration. We want to see the tongue hanging out, like, Ugh, you know, and, and, and really focused on the work sort of thing. Um, and so the more that they see the camera out, you know, and that it's not about posing and, and smiling, the more they get used to that, the easier it will be for you to... Um, get in close and take a picture without it interrupting what's going on. And when you can get in close and take a picture without interrupting, the, the picture that you get is so much more meaningful. There's so much more information there yes. for people to, to understand about the thinking. Um, but also it's, you know, this reminder to the children that uh, I'm not a, a cute or pretty thing to be looked at and admired. I am an empowered person and what you're interested in are my ideas and me as a, a human, as a, as a citizen, as a member of this place. And that comfort level is really important because consent is something really important. Like often I remember I wouldn't really consider consent because I think, oh, parents just said, yes, they can take pictures of my child in the room. But sometimes a child in a moment might not want their photo taken. So you really have to understand um, the reasoning why or the intention why you're doing something mm -hmm. so that they know that um, if you do take this photo, that's going because their work is being validated or you might ask them a question about if you can take a photo or something like that. Yeah. But a lot of work has to happen is what I'm trying to say uh, before you get into that space of um, citizenship or building citizenship. Yeah. And consent is a big part of that. You know, um, you, to go back to the very beginning about doing uh, with children or doing two children and four children, mm -hmm. um, when, you, when you have their consent to, to make a change in the classroom, you know, you ask them, what do you think about this decision? You know, if they don't agree, well, it's like, well, we need to revisit it if, if yeah. you don't want us to put this picture on the wall. You know, if, if this is not the right space for it, well, let's talk about why. Is this something that's, you know, very important to you that you want to keep private? Is this something that isn't finished yet that you want to keep working on? You know, and just um, using consent as a, a tool of negotiation and uh, it, yeah, as a tool of negotiation that leads to, I have a right to make decisions. I have agency here. Um, you know, I have, this, this space is my space yeah. and it's our space at the same time. It's not just your space that I'm entering. It's not your rules that I'm entering. Um, we have come up to a negotiation together about how this space will work. So I think consent is really important. And it's funny that it came up in documentation. Yeah, well. All right, we're going to talk about another topic in one second. All right, so now we're going to talk about how the environment uh, helps develop that sense of citizenship in the classroom. So um, in the beginning, in one of the earlier uh, moments. In one of the earlier videos, I said um, that we don't pre-design the environment and then the children come in and exist in it. And while that's somewhat true, we do have to have an initial environment set up for them to come into to respond to. 
We don't come into an empty room when we start. Um, the room does already exist. Um, my current situation, I'm working in a, for the school board here, and so the children all come in together in September, um, which isn't the usual situation for an early childhood classroom. Usually kids, you know, step into the room and another child steps out of the room sort of thing. So it's kind of this, you know, ongoing thing. But uh, so you have a constant evolution of input and change. But when the children come in in September all at once, um, you've got to start with something. You have to have you know, tables to eat at, you have to have places to think and learn and play already available to them. Um, so we do set up the room kind of, you know, with our best intentions in mind. But what's really important is that very early on, um, after we've gotten used to coming into the space and we're comfortable coming into the space, um, to change the space and to change it from uh, the, with the intent to make space for what they're doing or how they're using the space. So um, an example I have of that is uh, I had children doing a, um, a homework assignment and they wanted to uh, put their papers together to make a, a bigger picture. This was from the Zombie World Project. And, uh, you know, it was easy enough when it was just two of them. But then three or four friends wanted to join in and add their papers as well. And they were working at kind of a one-person desk. So, you know, we had to make more space for them to do so. We put some tables together to make it bigger. And then even more children got involved and all of a sudden it was, you know, five feet by seven feet of paper all taped together. And we did not have a table that could accommodate this. So we had to uh, empty our shelves, uh, knock them down, put them flat so that there was enough of a platform for the work to go on and for people to, to work with. So it was just a way that we could quickly adapt the environment to the needs of uh, kind of what where, where they were going with their work. So um, yeah, so you got to do things like that all the time. And uh, you know, another smaller, uh, much easier example is that I had a group um, of pre-primary children, so uh, kindergarten age, around four years old, um, come in and I, I had one boy who didn't um, speak English yet. He understood it but he wasn't able to communicate uh, back to me anything that he wanted to say. Um, and I had set up a classroom. Um, I had recently moved some giant boxes out of a dramatic area and put in uh, the wooden toy furniture because the boxes had become a little bit ruined through play. And uh, after I had put the, you know, the kitchen pieces back in place, the oven and the fridge and the microwave, um, he decided, oh, you know, it, it's not quite right. And he kind of just moved something just a little bit. And I was like, oh, so then I took the next piece and put it next to it and, and moved it. And I'm like, is, you know, that what you wanted to do? And, uh, because of just that little, you know, that little notice, my notice of him making a little adjustment, he decided that he was going to redesign the entire, uh, the entire area and move things around and make this wall of furniture, which I would never do, but it was just an empowering moment for him as a child who wasn't able to express himself verbally to really have um, agency, to really have the ability to say how this space would be laid out in a space that he wanted to use. Mm -hmm. um, so just little things like that allow uh, children to know, oh, I can make the choices in this space, um, the choices that affect me and the choices that may even affect others or at least be involved in the discussion, whether I have the words or not, you know. Um, I will also go off of the same thing where children are developing the space with you. Um, when I was working at also the school board and I had not had a room yet and we were getting all this furniture, but we didn't have the room. So then what happened was, um, I would daily just tell the ch children, well, what do you, if we could move into our classroom today, what do you think it would look like? And a lot of them never even had that opportunity to have a question like that or even design a space that would be for them. So I had to um, really think about what am I actually asking them? And if they've never had that experience before, how do I give them that experience? So we decided to go on a visit, like a trip. We were actually in the library and then we went downstairs to where our space was. So I got to show them how they were scrubbing the floors they were painting the room and they got to see that. And I would take photographs of the empty room before it was filled up. 
and I would take it back to the library and we would see it on a big projector and I would have the children actually draw um, on acetate paper and on an overhead projector and they would able to kind of map out where they wanted things to go. So in the, when we finally got to move in, they helped me build furniture and just put things into different places where they had thought it would look good. And it turned out in the beginning, everything was sort of all in the center close to the wall, but we had this huge room to fill up and they started to like look around. And of course they ran around in the room. They did a whole bunch of like knocking into each other. And then they realized themselves that it wasn't working. Their plan wasn't working. So then I thought, okay, well, this is an opportunity for them to think about, you know, expanding out from that cluster of stuff and moving it out. So it took a long time for them to kind of uh, realize that they can move that furniture around. And I mean, by the time, I mean, we moved in mid October and by December, we got carpets in our room, like, cause that wasn't even on their mind, but it, that's kind of how it, it went. And, uh, that entire year with them kind of was shaping a room for children that, uh, <laughs> it's funny because they left, but it helped design for the room for the next year's student, students. Hmm. So they kind of played around with it. And it was a great project because, um, it was something that I had never done before. I would have everything kind of set up, but this time I was really challenged them to say, okay, well, why did you put it there? and have those conversations with them. Yeah. Um, something that's great about having that big space that you had is you could really play with um, the amount of flexibility you had. Yeah. You had so much space um, that it was like really easy to be like, I could make a number of extra yeah. areas that I didn't have space for before. That's right. Um, so part of, part of the room design uh, when trying to encourage children to be a part of the discussion is making this space flexible, using the furniture in a flexible way, knocking down shelves or pushing um, the chairs around, the tables around, really making it so that they know that nothing is nailed down, nothing has to be the way it is, yeah. um, and uh, kind of just showing that from time to time, how flexible the space can be. But I also want to bring back um, how you bring other people or parents into that environment. Mm -hmm. uh, so some of the things, like I'm not a builder at all, uh, I can read directions, but I'm, that's not my like focus. I feel like I just can't focus on how you build furniture. And so we actually had some parents come in, work with the children on building like a table. We had, um, other educators in the building come over and bring plants because they weren't able to take care of them. So they said to the children, are you able to take care of these plants if, if they're in there? And, you know, the children will say, oh, I did that with my nan. And then I can say, oh, well, how do we take care of these plants? So that's how the room started to kind of develop. We started bringing people in to help us in areas where we were maybe not comfortable with. And that's how our room sort of grew and it became our own. Hmm. Nice. And what about um, the other thing you did there where you uh, went around the community and brought the oh. community in? So, um, for that, uh, I haven't, I didn't actually, I'm not from that community and I wasn't, um, familiar with it. So I actually asked the children for them to take me on a tour of where they live, places they love to go to. And so we started taking photographs of, um, favorite places that they've been to. And, um, I taught them how to actually use my phone because I didn't have like a camera. And so they were able to take photographs of their perspective. So it's like really low, um, shots, but I blew them up and had them in the room in different areas of the space. And, uh, they were, they would invite their parents or grandparents to come in to show the, uh, photographs that they took of their community. Nice. Yeah. So they were able to, you know, decide how to make their home be part of their classroom. Yeah, and they were so excited to show where they lived. Awesome. And then bring that into the space. Great. All right, so we're gonna talk about another subject in just a second. All right, and we're back. 
Um, so the uh, last main uh, thing that I wanted to really hit home about, uh, you know, developing citizenship is the idea of negotiation. Um, and what I, what I mean by negotiation is not just like deciding who gets how much of what, but um, negotiating uh, within the environment, negotiating where we're going to go that day, negotiating who I, whose ideas are we going to... If ducks have eyes. If ducks have eyes, sure. Um, so, um, yeah, so one of the things that's really important about negotiation is um, in, you know, in older groups, I guess, is the dialogue and the ability to, you know, discuss with children um, the daily happenings and the plans for those things. So um, what I like to do in the morning with my preschool group is, you know, we are outside of the school and we line up, they line up against the wall, I stand in front of them, um, and I'm just like, okay, who's got an idea? Like, what are we going to do today? And, you know, at first their ideas are really uh, rudimentary, like we're going to go to the playground. And I'm like, okay, what are we going to do with the playground? And, you know, so on and so forth and kind of pull the idea out of them. Um, and when there is no idea or it's the same idea three days in a row without really a reason for that, then I'll, you know, add my own idea. I'm like, oh, I found a new place that we could try. Uh, it's, there's this bridge that we could go walk on and we can look below and see what else is down there. Um, and then, you know, I'll, I'll kind of introduce new things, new places to the group or, or new ways of, uh, filling our morning time. Um, anyway, what ends up happening is, uh, during our play, somebody will come up with an idea that they want to share during that time. And I'll, I'll remind them when we're lining up. I'm like, hey, remember you were telling me that we needed to collect leaves? You told me that we needed to find pumpkins. Uh, why don't you share that with the group and see what they think? Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, we, we're standing around and we're like, we need to collect leaves and pumpkins. And I'm like, what do we need to collect leaves and pumpkins for? And they're like, because Halloween is coming. And I'm like, why do we need leaves and pumpkins for Halloween? Um, and they're like, for decorations. And I'm like, okay, where do we find leaves and pumpkins? You know, and, you know, going through that negotiation of, you've got an idea, I want to know why it's important. You tell me why it's important. I want to know how to, you know, follow that idea. Um, and that, that's something that we do. I mean, it's really easy with the children who are able to speak, um, but it does take time, you know, and it does take patience and willingness to go do things that you think are going to fail. You know, I want to go to the playground and sit on the swings. I'm like, well, how is that going to lead to an idea? Ugh, are we just wasting your time? But you need to follow up on that and go there and allow them to have the, the choice, the decision of where to go. You know, you can put things in too, but for a couple of times in between your choices, you've got to make it about their choices so that they know, hey, it's worth it for me to say where I want to go because we could go there. We probably will go there. And even if it's not today, it might be tomorrow. Um, that's another thing about the negotiations. Uh, sometimes we do use voting, um, you know, whether you each have a token and you put it in a certain basket to decide which idea gets chosen. Um, often what I like to do is, you know, we get two, two or three ideas and the most popular idea is the idea we do first. But that doesn't mean that the other two ideas aren't followed. You know, the next day, instead of opening it up and saying, what's the new idea for today? I'm like, hey, remember yesterday we went to play at the hill because that was Matthew's idea and a lot of people wanted to do that. But Justin also had an idea that he wanted to go to the hockey court and draw with chalk. And since we did Matthew's idea at first, we're going to do Justin's idea now. You know, and, and you, you make it so that giving an idea, sharing an idea... Um, even if it's not the most popular one, still gets its time, just not the first time sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it's not just about, you know, popularity wins and the less popular don't get anything. It's pop popular vote first, the other ideas come as well, you know, and we find a way to make sure that all of the ideas get used and heard and, and appreciated. Um, when I was working with toddlers, uh, I had a little guy who just kept seeing the moon and wanted to touch the moon. Mm -hmm. And so my coworker printed off a moon and stuck it on the ceiling. Okay. And, and he hadn't noticed it, but we would always read, um, 
like books. Like he always wanted me to read books to him. So he was sitting there and one day he kept saying, moon, moon, and he got so excited on his face. And I was excited because he finally saw the moon. So he wanted to touch it and his verbal language wasn't like great. So he finally, um, I was wondering how we would get it. So he would like try to climb the wall and try to reach it. But obviously, you know, he would slide down. He pulled over books and tried to climb on top of it. And he actually brought over the uh, bookshelf and it slat, slatted, slated? Slatted. And he tried to climb up there and only got him a certain height. And so that was an opportunity where I said to the whole rest of the toddlers that this child had a problem. He wants to touch the moon. How are we going to get to the moon? And, I, you know, that's where all those ideas were coming in. And someone said that there was a ladder and we're like, okay, where's the ladder? So we had to like walk around the whole center because I know they knew that they saw the ladder, but they didn't know where. So we walked around for like hours trying to find this like ladder. We finally find it and they said it's too heavy to bring to our classroom. So then we had all these little toddlers trying to carry this ladder down with me, um, these stairs, and then put it up in the room. But for some reason, that wasn't uh, good enough. Well, not good enough. It wasn't high enough because they got to a certain point, but they still couldn't reach it. Then finally, this one little girl came up with, we used to, um, or we did have a tool project mm -hmm. and she saw like a, a measuring tape. And she was able to figure out to how to click it and then keep testing how much um, of the measuring tape needed to stay out. And he got to climb to the top, get the measuring tape and touch the moon um, based on all of these people's uh, ideas. Mm -hmm. And so that was really cool to see that they were, um, you know, testing out their theories. Like I need it this long, I need it this long. And they even tried like a blanket, but the blanket, they didn't have enough arm space to like hit. So all of that stuff they knew, but all of their ideas sort of worked together. And then they were so excited when he actually got to touch the moon and they were screaming of how excited they were that all of their ideas helped him get to the moon. Amazing, right? And that was toddlers. Yeah, and that's toddler age. And that's, I mean, you know, typically a very hard <laughs> to negotiate age, yeah. but... Um, Great, when we're following somebody's ambition to touch the moon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another thing that's really important uh, as part of this negotiation is uh, the idea of being wrong or not winning mm -hmm. as the adult in charge. Um, and this can be really hard for people. Um, I know that in a classroom, you really want to keep control for safety. You know, you want, if you're walking down the road and you tell somebody to move to the sidewalk because they're about to wander into traffic, you want them to hear your words and move right away, you know? So you, I, I understand that we do want control and we do want people to know that we're in uh, control for safety. But uh, when it comes to like ideas and negotiations, we really need to allow ourselves to lose and to be wrong just so that they know that when we respond to an idea, it doesn't mean that that is the only right idea, you know? And it's, it's really difficult uh, to do that in a way that's not really uh, patronizing, you know, to come up with kind of a wrong theory with children who are obviously much younger than you, much less wise than you. Um, so it's, um, but you, you need to take those opportunities wherever you can find them. And, you know, one of the, one of the easiest ways is in talking about their families and their experience. You know, we can make assumptions about that, about them and their ideas and, uh, or not them and their ideas, them and their life, their family and everything. And if we're wrong, we can really point out how wrong we were and how that's okay to be wrong. You know, it's good for them to know that it's okay, that we're okay with being wrong yeah. and we're okay with them being wrong. And that if we have an idea or an opinion, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily right or best or the one that we're gonna go with. And having that conversation with them is really important to just say, you know what, I was wrong or... Mm -hmm or set that up somehow so that they can see like, oh, even they're saying that they're wrong and they can acknowledge it. And it's not like a, an uncomfortable situation. They're seeing it as, um, that they can say, 
I was wrong, but I, I'm learning from this. Mm -hmm. And even, even further than being wrong, admitting that you don't know a lot frequently is really important yeah. um, in the classroom, just to like, um, to level that dynamic of, you know, I'm bigger with more yeah. experience and able to articulate myself better. So probably I'm right all the time. But like when we're walking in the woods and we see a mushroom, I don't know what that mushroom is. Yeah. I don't know if we can eat that. We are not going to try. Yeah. You know, uh, we could go back and get a book and ask somebody and maybe you know something because your mom is a botanist or whatever a fungus expert is called. And they know all about the mushrooms that can be forged locally. And you know that that's a safe mushroom. Well, I don't know that. And we're going to have to find out more information. So, you know, talking about what you don't know is also really important. Um, I mean, it's also really good for you, you know, to, to let go of your ego a bit, but, um, and even allow yourself to learn something, but really to express, I don't know, you know, when they, when they say things, you don't have to have the answer. You shouldn't be giving out answers because that's exhausting. It is exhausting. But um, yeah, you really want to be, you know, developing ideas rather than uh, accumulating facts. You know, I don't care if the kids know that an oak tree comes from an acorn yeah. and that an oak leaf looks a certain way and a maple leaf looks a different way. That's not really important to me. Um, that doesn't really add to anybody's citizenship or well-being or the development of their critical thinking. You know, that's just a fact that they happen to know because somebody else explained it to them. Um, it's all about having a theory, being willing to test that theory, being okay with being wrong, or having an unpopular opinion. Well, it developed researchers because you're helping them find the answers and the different ways of getting that answer. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, I, I guess that's kind of part of the, the citizenship, at least in the way that we're yeah. teaching, is that um, we really... We want, we want to be researching the way the children are thinking and interacting with each other. And we want them to be researching what they want to know about. And, uh, and we want to empower them to express ways that they want to know about things. Yeah. Yeah. And when they're wrong, they have to understand why they were wrong. And that it's okay to be wrong. Yeah. Really. Like that's, I think the most important thing we're wrong so often you know, we want them to be wrong because if they automatically think of the right thing, how will they know how to get to the right answer when they are inevitably wrong? And, and Matthew just said it, like, we're wrong a lot. And when we acknowledge it in front of the children and we're not like getting so upset about it, but we can laugh about it and maybe we'll go to our coworker and say, okay, I was wrong about this. Um, what do you think? Or where are we going to go next? Or even telling the children, I was wrong and this is what, what do you think next? And then they might have the idea and then following on that. Yeah, I had a situation where um, I had judged a child's artwork incorrectly. Um, we had a, a kid in our class who, um, who was, you know, had uh, seen things that other children in our class hadn't based on the environment that he was growing up in. So he drew a picture of a drug deal. I don't know if this is because he saw something on TV or he saw something in his neighborhood. I'm not really sure where it came from. Um, because at the time I was not ready for that artwork. So, so um, oh no, this is not the one I'm talking about. I mean, he did that as well. But uh, what he did was uh, we brought in a, um, an, a human figure mannequin, mannequin Drawing thing mannequin. For, to draw. And uh, he came in and we put it in the middle of the table just as kind of like, if you want to draw something, here's something you could draw. You don't have to draw this, but you know, here it is in the middle of the art table whatever. Um, so he drew a picture of Spider-Man and, uh, he's like, look, Matthew, I drew a picture of, uh, the mannequin wearing a Spider-Man costume. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever, Justin, like, as if that's what happened. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't say those words to him. I'm like, oh, nice. Um, and then I was like showing my coworker, I'm like, hey, Alicia, like, can you believe that, you know, he said this, like, you know, what a goose. And uh, she's like, no, no, he really did. Uh, here are his other pictures of the mannequin putting on the co Spider-Man costume. And there were a couple separate pictures of the mannequin not dressed with the Spider-Man costume on the floor and then half dressed and then mostly dressed. And he showed me the final product. And I was like, oh my God, why did I assume, you know? So what I did with that is I wrote it up as a piece of documentation uh, of two pieces of paper 
you know, the first piece of paper with the first presented image, and I'm like, Mateo pretends, or Justin pretends that this uh, Spider-Man uh, is a mannequin wearing a Spider-Man costume, and then turn it over, and like, after discussing with my coworker, I found out, blah, blah, blah. And uh, it was really great because they were school age children, and they could see me acknowledging in writing how wrong I was and what my assumption was. Um, and it kind of, uh, it developed a little bit more trust, you know, uh, between us, and uh, which was definitely necessary because uh, we had some issues in the past with trust. Uh, but it's it's really important to go through that and and say that, you know, I was wrong and I'm okay with being wrong. You know, it's important that I'm wrong. How else will I know if I'm right if I've never been wrong? Or if I can't admit when I'm wrong, sort of thing. So, yeah. So, uh, just one more topic to discuss. All right. So, we are now concluding. And basically what we're trying to say about how you develop citizenship within the classroom is developing a culture of trust. Mm -hmm. and negotiations and uh, it comes uh, from your authentic self so you're not we're giving you examples of um, what we did but it's important that you understand who you are and what type of um, citizens you're going to be putting out into the world but it's it's got to be rooted in um, trust I think yeah another really important thing is as the the teacher in the classroom ego plays such a huge role because you're trying to represent yourself as a professional. You want to be the best teacher that you can be and get the best results and have the best, best, best. Yeah. But you need to let go of that ego and understand that you've got to learn. You've got to be open to being wrong. You've got to allow other people's perspectives, though you may not agree with them, to be included in the dialogue of um, the culture. So um, a big thing also in this uh, citizenship is letting go of your ego. You can't, you can't be, you know, the chief and still have full participation. You've got to be a participant, not just, yeah. not just the chief sort of thing. And when you do that, it, it's actually a lot more fun, I think, because then the environment gets built around that. Your documentation comes because you're excited about all of these ideas and you're validating them. And then the children are giving you that reciprocal um, confirmation. Mm. And then it's like that cycle. Then parents come in because they're starting to see what you're doing. You're excited about your, your job. Yeah. And the other thing is like that feedback, you know, if you, if your ideas are obviously the ideas that everybody's always going to do, you know, who knows if you're doing it right. But if, you're in a group and you've all got an idea and everybody feels that, you know, we do different ideas every day, but people are latching on to your idea. It's like, oh, they actually do want to, uh, you know, go on this hike and try this out. You know, I know that they have the right to choose not to. Yeah. You know, they didn't choose to yesterday, but today they want to. So I know that they're, you know, that's, that's half the battle. They want to be there yeah. and then we can go and have fun, you know? So it, it's really rewarding but it's also very difficult to get to that point. Uh, um, so it's a lot of work in the beginning and then it's, you know, all, uh, all downstream from there. You're just cruising <laughs> along, enjoying the ride. Like, uh, what is that? Tubing? Tubing or uh, like rafting. Or anyway, uh, thanks so much for listening to us today. We're excited to hear about your questions and discussion points and- uh, Looking forward to hearing from you. And hopefully uh, you guys, Great, uh, great citizenship in your classrooms. All right, bye now.